So let's start. So first we're going to go over supervised learning. Um, just a quick overview of what we've covered so far and how neural nets are going to fit into that. Then we're going to look at neural nets as circuits. I'm going to take a look at one neural net, uh, one neuron. Um, we'll do an example with that, and then we'll do uh, forward propagation. So just a quick overview for supervised learning. So supervised learning, we have a bunch of these x, y training points. And we want to do something to them. We want to do something with all these to come up with some box. Which we're going to call like our, our like rule, right? We want to come up with some rule or some algorithm. But then we're going to be able to take another uh, feature space. Uh, Feature, sorry, a set of features that we don't know how to classify. We're going to feed it into that box and it's going to give us some best guess for why. So I put a little hammer line because that's that means to guess, it's not one we know. It's just my notation for it. Um, and so that's what we'd like to do. And we've seen how each do this. And so we feed in all of our training points. And what we do is we use that with a, a learning algorithm. So it's not the same as the rule algorithm. So we, we're going to use the learning algorithm to construct a decision algorithm or a rule algorithm or whatever the decision making policy is. So we're going to use a learning algorithm. And that's going to build our tree. Right, so that's how ID trees work. And, you know, some of these might have like five branches <coughs> like that. And then the algorithm, the rule at the end is to use this tree by feeding in the input and seeing when it comes out. Right. We also have seen this with the nearest neighbors. So we take the training points, we do something to them to get, we use some learning algorithm to get a decision making scheme. And the decision making scheme is like the boundary lines, or you can think of it as you could just compute nearest neighbors afterwards. You could just look at the map and see which ones are the nearest. So we're gonna this one's a little easier, but you could think of it like the learning algorithm is taking these points and drawing the nearest neighbor's decision boundaries. And then our decision making is you look at the boundaries wherever you end up, you use the boundaries to classify. Okay? And so then we get this kind of picture where we have all these lines. And this one we also if you draw it on on a like a graph, instead of getting a tree, you get like all these perpendicular lines to each other. For nearest neighbors, you can get all these sort of arbitrary lines, and then you can, you know, put a point there and say, oh, it falls within this little area, so it's of type plus or minus, right? And then today we're going to talk about neural nets. Okay, and so they're going to take similarly. They're just going to take a bunch of these training points. This is one training point, but we have a bunch of these. We're going to feed them all in. And using some learning algorithm, we're going to get some some rule for classifying points. Okay. Awesome. So, in an abstract sense, uh, a neural net is just a circuit. It's like kind of like a circuit that takes your inputs, and it's going to feed it through this box. And each part of the input goes through one of these wires. And then on the other side, we get an output, right? And now this box has a couple properties inside of it. We're going to open up that box and see what's inside. But it's parameterized by these Ws or these weights. And so once you have a neural net, so you have a circuit kind of built, you can keep tweaking it by changing these Ws. And so you can imagine there's a little knob for W1 and for W2 and W3, and you can change each one, OK? And so we're going to use that, changing those, those Ws, each one, to try to get this guessed output to 
to better approximate what we want it to output. So using the training examples, we might put like some x, and we think it should be y, but it gives us this y hat instead. And that y and that y hat might be like really different. And so we can start tweaking these knobs, changing these w's, and try to get these closer together. Okay. Awesome. Okay, cool. So if these are circuits, we have to talk about what are the circuit elements we're going to use to build these circuits. Um, if you don't like circuits, it's also, you can just think of it as like functions, something like that. It's really not as complicated as most circuit classes or anything like that. So let's look at one neuron. What does one of these things look like? And so a net is going to be made up of a bunch of these neurons all hooked up together, and we'll talk about them in a second. But one neuron is going to look like this. So here's an example. Of one. 51, 52, 53, 54. Get summed up. Pass through the threshold. And then Y comes out. Okay? <laughs> so, what this picture is saying is we're going to split X into its components. So, X1, X2, X3, all those little features. We're going to pass them each through one of these wires. So, X1 might go through here, X2 through here. Three, four. They're going to get multiplied by this W. Okay. Then they're going to get added up. And then we're going to compare them to see if we get, we're going to compare them to some threshold value to see if we should output a 1 or a 0. And so the way this would look for, let's make an even simpler example. So let's say we had A and B. And usually this whole part of it. Since the sum doesn't have any parameters, you can just kind of mush those together. And whenever I draw just this part of it, you can assume that there's a sum in front of it that I'm just not going to draw. Because otherwise, I have to draw the box every time. So this becomes that. Um, okay. So let's say we called our inputs x and y, and we called our output out. And so this is the notation M34 uses. Notice it's really different from my notation, where y is the output. Here, y is actually one of the, one of the features of our input. And the output is just called out. Okay, so if you're confused about that, we can talk about it later. But these are just inputs, right? And so what would what would the rule for classifying x and y be based on this neuron? And so what we would do is x would get multiplied by a, so we get ax. Y would be multiplied by b, we get by. We'd add them up because of the sum box that's not found there. And so we'd get like ax plus by. And now we use a thresholding function, which is just going to say if it's greater than or equal to T, we're going to output a 1. Otherwise, if it wasn't greater than or equal to T, we're going to output a 0. Okay? And so this thing over here, this is going to be either a 1 or a 0. Okay. So that's what one neuron looks like. Uh, so let's just run through a really, really simple example first, just with some numbers so you guys can see it. So I'm just going to make this off the top of my head, so hopefully my math isn't too bad. But let's say x1 was 2, and this one was 1, this one was minus 1, and this one was a 3. And the weights were, actually, let me do it this way. First, we build the neuron, and then we're going to pass an input to the neuron. So let's say we built our neuron with weights 7, uh, minus 1, 4, and 2, right? And a threshold of, let's say, 5. Okay. So that's what a neuron looks like. And now we can pass it inputs and see what the output would be. So now that this is fixed and we're not changing this, let's pass in 2, 1, minus 1, 3. See what happens. And so we can do this one wire at a time. So we see 2 times a 7. That gives us a 14 right here. The 1 minus 1 gives us a minus 1. The 1 and the minus 4 gives us a minus 4. The 2 and the 3 give us a 6. We add those all up. And so what do we get? We get uh, 2 minus 1 is 1 plus 14 is 15. I think the math is right. Um, either way, you add these all up. And you get some number, and then you check, is that number greater than or equal to 5? And if it is, which it is, we get a 1. And if it hadn't been, we get a 0. Okay. So this is called forward propagation. For, this is for one neuron, but we're coming from the inputs. And we're doing all the stuff all the way to the end and getting an output. Okay. We're going from the inputs to the outputs. That's forward propagation. But we're going to talk about that a little more once we get a network, because then we can kind of generalize that idea. Awesome.
so all of these all these neurons and stuff uh, um, are trying to there's some function that is actually in charge of taking x's and making them y's and we don't know what that function is it's some like natural function that we're trying to guess with our that's what we're that's the whole point of supervised learning we're trying to find out how do we make these x's into these y's okay and so the neural network is trying to best approximate those functions okay so one way to think about neural networks is to find out for one neuron what sort of functions can we approximate what things can we do with one neuron and what things will we need more neurons to do so let's look at one neuron this Let's just look at 2D, okay? And so what I mean by 2D is that our inputs are just going to have, our inputs can be made up of two features, okay? So x1, x2, or in uh, 03, 04 notation, x and y. And we have some weight b, a and b, and then we pass them into this neuron. We get some output. And so the reason I keep drawing this little thing here is that that's supposed to represent a step function. And so that, what that's supposed to tell us is that this neuron either outputs a 0 or a 1, depending on where you draw that separator. That's just for you guys to know. But if you know how this all works, it's, it's just saying that t is like something to compare against the sum of those inputs times their weights. OK. So what sort of things can we make with that? Well, you can imagine drawing this thing, the outputs of this thing, on some graph. And so you could have x and y. And remember, A and B and T are already set to something. So we have A, B, and T. And now we can ask, how about this point right here? This is X and Y. Is that a plus or a minus? Right? And so we could just ask about it and say, OK, that's a plus, and then draw another one here. That might be a minus and a plus. And we could ask for all these points what they are and kind of get a sense of what <coughs> this thing is doing. But we can be a little more analytical and think, OK, this thing is a 1. Whenever theta x plus by going to t, and this and is a zero if theta x plus by is less than t. Okay, and so the interesting boundary between these two cases is theta x plus by equals t. Right, and so actually, whether you do a greater than or equals here, or whether you do a less than or equals here, is just a convention. O three four tends to use greater than or equals becomes a one. Um, but you should, if, if you're not sure, the test should specify that. And if it doesn't, you can assume it's this convention. Okay, so if we look at ax plus by equals t, and we graph that, we can actually, we're actually going to get something like this, like a line. And so this is just a linear equation, right? We could solve for y. We could get like y equals a over bx plus t over b. Equals right, or minus, right? And so for like positive values of these things, it's going to have a different negative slope, which is why I drew it that way. But you could also have it going the other way, depending on your A and B values. And so you want to think of it as drawing a line. Okay? And so that's the boundary condition. But now we have this, when it, whenever it's greater than that, it's going to be a 1. So these points are all greater. And whenever it's less than that down here, which I'm not going to shade, it's going to be a 0. Okay? And so now it's really easy to tell. If I draw a line, if I draw a point right here, what does that neuron think it's going to be? It's really easy. It's just the one because it's on the shaded side. Okay. So drawing these lines is going to help you visualize this a lot. Okay. Cool. So now that we know that, let's try to make our neuron learn how to become. Let, let's let's ask: Could a neuron ever become anything like the function n? Okay. And so in more interesting examples, you would think: Could a neuron become a function that could like look at images and tell if they're faces or not? But just do a really really simple example. Could a neuron try to become like the function and? So for the function and, we have x and y and neuron t. We have weights a and b. Okay. And so the question is, what values of t, a, and b do I need to do so that it'll behave like an and? And behaving like an and means if I put a 0 for the x and a 0 for the y, it should be a 0. If I make one of these a 1, the other is zero, it should still be a zero. But if I make both of them ones, it should be a one. 
Okay. So the question is, what values of A, B, and T will give me that behavior for all of those points? So let's maybe let's draw it out. And so it's kind of weird, but I'm just going to draw zero not directly on the corner, so that I can draw a point like on zero zero, and it's not going to be like might eat up by the axes crossing. So we could think of something like that, and I'm just going to use pluses and minuses. So a one is like a plus, or a zero is like a minus. But I could do zero, so I could say like zero. 0, 0, 1. As long as that's not confusing, these are like the actual values at those locations and these are the labels. Um, but sometimes I use like minuses here and plus there. So the question is, can a single neuron identify all these points correctly given the values of A, B, and T? Yeah? So why do you say yes? Who said that? Did you say A, B, and T? Okay, so maybe we want to draw this line and shade everything above it. And that'll do it, right? Anything above the line gets classified as a one. Oh, we get that one correct. Anything below the line gets classified as a zero. Oh, we get all those correct too. So it gets everything correct. And so as was suggested, you could try fitting AX plus BY to the matrix T. And you could think, oh, well, maybe if this thing was 1.5 and X was 1 and 1. Then you can plug in all these points. 0, 0, 0, 0 is not greater than or equal to 1.5, so it's a 0, just like we wanted. 1, 0, so one of these being a 0 and the other one a 1, it's going to be just going to put a 1 on this side. 1 is not greater than 1.5, so we're going to get more zeros for these two points. But for this point, 1 plus 1 is 2, which is greater than 1.5, and so we get a 1 there. Right? So these values of A, B, and T will make us behave like an N. Okay. So let's put that in our toolbox. So neurons, we can use them to do ANDs. Okay. So what about something like an OR? So an OR is going to be kind of the same thing, except these are going to both be ones. So what do you guys think? Can we make that with one neuron? Yeah, so if we keep A equal to 1 and B equal to 1, we actually only have to change T to be 0 0.5, and we'll end up drawing a line like this. I didn't really draw the scale, but right, they'll go under these two points and above this one. And so you can check the math there. If you do X plus Y greater than or equal to 0 0.5, if you plug in the coordinates of that point, you'll get the output correct for those points. Right? Awesome, so we can definitely do an or. So that's part of our toolbox too. Okay, what about, can we do something like, we do something like not x. Okay, and so not x would look like this. Okay, so we look at x, we look at y, and we think, okay, whatever x is, well, it's a 1. It has to be the opposite of that in the case here. Okay? Whatever x is, well, it's a 1. Opposite of that is a 0. x is 0, opposite of that's a 1. x is still 0, opposite of that's a 1. Okay? So that's not x. Can we use a neural net to classify those points correctly like that? So we can, again, just draw a line like that. Now the question is, we could have drawn like a slightly skewed line, right? But I drew a vertical line. So can we draw vertical lines? Is actually an interesting question. So why do you say yes? So you said x plus a or b equals to zero. Which one? A is equal to b. Yeah. So the intuition here is we're making a decision based on x alone and not y. So it makes sense to weight y by zero because we don't care about y. The other thing you could do is think, well, what is this line? This is a line like x less than or equal to t. Let's make this 0 0.5. Right, so this is line, sorry, this is x equal to point, uh, 0.5, and then we're shooting the left side. It's going to be a less than. Okay. That seems all good. Now the question is, can we represent this in terms of 
something like this. So what A, B, and T values give us this one? And so the one thing is, oh, we've got this less than or equal to. Let's flip it by multiplying by minus 1 on both sides. And so we get minus x greater than or equal to 0 plus 5. And now trivial, right? A is just minus 1. B is just 0 because there's no y's there. And T is 0 plus 5. That will draw that line for us and shade on the left side. So we've actually proven two things with this example. Sorry? Oh, yes. Minus 6. We got the multiply negative on the other side too. So we've proven two really crucial things, which is we can draw vertical lines, which isn't something that we take in for granted all the time, because they have weird slopes, right? But we can. And the other thing too is we can shade on either side. We can just flip this by multiplying both sides by negative one. So no big deal. So now basically what we have is with one neuron, we've, we've also done not for one of the inputs. And so we've kind of shown you can draw a line and shade it on either side. Okay? Awesome. So now, let's try a trick here. So what about trying to model XOR? Okay, so this is what XOR looks like. It's only one when exactly one of the inputs is one. Otherwise it's a zero. Okay, so there's XOR. So the question is, can we make a neuron that does that? No? I saw people shaking their heads over here. So. Anyone have a reason for no? Yes, I can't really separate this with one line. What about something like that goes through one and one? Like vertically. Yeah, so the problem is that. Unfortunately, this t, this like node isn't caring about whether it's equal to. It cares about whether it's greater than or equal to. So it's going to shade the whole sides. And so we're going to get at least one of these wrong. We shade the bottom, we get this one wrong. We shade the top, we get that one wrong. We still can't do it. Well, that's a bummer. All right. Well, with one neuron, we can't do that. So let's increase our firepower and let's use a couple neurons to do it. So let's think about this. What? What can I do? Could I use just two lines, maybe, to separate this? So I could. There's a couple options. I could do something like this and take some combination of those lines. I could do something like this right, and get these original lines. And that way I've kind of separated the space. Or I could also do something like this. And separate the space. Okay. So now let's try to think about this case first when I do this. Right? So I drew two lines. So that probably means I need two neurons. And so they're both, I have x and y. This neuron is going to be drawing a line with x and y. And this neuron is going to be drawing a line with x and y. Okay, and so now I've drawn the lines. That's what that neural network does. It draws these two lines for me. But now, which side should we shade? So for this, let's label these. So let's call this L1. Actually, let's call this um, N1 and 2. And so let's say that N1 draws this bottom line and N2 draws this top line. Which way should N1 shade? Should shade below or above? So above seems to be a better choice. We get some of these points right, but we still get this one wrong. And so let's just label that real quick. So N1 thinks that this bottom space over here should be a zero. N1 thinks that this middle space should be a one. And N1 thinks this top space should be a one. Okay. Now what about N2? So N2 is kind of just symmetrical to that, so it's just going to be shading the bottom, right? So let's see, let's see what N2 thinks. So N2 thinks this should be a zero. N2 thinks this should be a one. And N2 thinks this should be a one. And so now I've got these, N1 and N2 each think different things, represented by the outputs of these two nodes. And so maybe there's a way of combining what they think to come up with what we want, which is that it should only be ones in the middle, okay? 
Does anyone see what we can do about this? Maybe add something over here. Yeah, so an end game might do it for us. And so I'm just going to draw it as an end because we've already proven that one neuron would be an end. So I'm going to put an end like this. And what that's going to do is it's going to say only when both of these things are one do I put, I put a one. And so that makes sense because here's a zero and a one. They're not both one. So the combination of those to an end is a zero. Oh, we got that point right. Combination of these two is a zero. So we get that point right. Combination of these two is they're both one. So we get a one. So these both are right. Okay. And so you can see we have kind of two layers. We have this layer that's drawing lines for us, has access to the inputs directly, so we can draw some lines. And then layers after that combine those drawings of lines in cool ways. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's how you could have done it. You could have drawn these two lines like that and done it. Because we only needed an end here, and we can do that with just one more neuron. Now, let's try what would have happened if instead, if we had drawn this case, it's just the same thing. It's just pretty much the same thing, just the A's and B's are like negatives and you switch like the offsets a little bit. Not really that different. But now let's think about if you have divided up a space like that. So here's N1, here's N2. Okay. So now let's see what N1 and N2 think each space should be. So I'm just going to pick always shading up and to the right, unless that turns out to be a bad idea, and then we can switch it. Okay. So let's say N1. It's going to shade up. So N1 thinks this should be a 1. N1 thinks this should be a 1. N1 thinks this should be a 0. N1 thinks this should be a 0. Right? And now N2 thinks this should be a 0. N2 thinks this should be a 0. N2 thinks this should be a 1, and N2 thinks this should be a 1. Okay. So that's if I'm shading up with N1 and to the right with N2. We can switch it if you guys want, but it's pretty much the same if we choose any sort of shading. We're going to get some sort of mismatch like this, where in these two corners they agree on what they should be, and in these two corners they disagree. Right? And so how can we make the disagreements be 1 and the agreements be 0? Well, we just need XOR again. So, uh oh, that's not a really good way to do it. Because now it's like, okay, now take the XOR of that. And then you have to like draw the XOR, but that's what we were trying to do. And so you just keep drawing more and more and more, and you'll never get there. So that's not a good way of doing it. But don't do it that way. Um, so that's for separating like data points like that. Okay, so now that we have an intuition on that, let's jump into a problem that asks us, um, actually let's just do one more thing real quick. So if I have an arbitrary x and y, I have some nodes here. Let's say we have something like that. Okay. So we can take a look at this. Sorry. There we go. That's better. Okay. We can take a look at this. We can kind of separate it. We can see, okay, these points here, I've drawn them nicely, they're kind of lined up, but they might not be lined up. But you can think of the ones that have direct access to the inputs. Those are the input layer. Also, column <coughs> contain that 034, we like to call them the draw lines layer. Makes it easier to think about. And then everything after that, and I've only drawn one node here, but you can imagine there's these, there could be more stuff here. This is like the logic functions that combine the lines in some way. Okay. Okay, and so each one of these will give us a line. And remember that they, depending, this one, for instance, doesn't have access to Y at all. So this one can only draw vertical lines. So it can only separate the space by Xs, and it doesn't care what Y is. Equivalently, if this had only access to Y, we can only draw horizontal lines. So we're only separating the space by Y value. Okay, awesome. So now, see here. <laughs> so this is going to be from quiz 2 2013 
Um, no, yes, Chris two. Chris three, yes, Chris three. There we go. Okay, cool. So we have a couple potential um, neural nets to choose from. So this neural net is called A. And we have this is called B. Let's see. And we have little notes taking its own threshold and it's got their own weights. Okay. And so I could ask a question like, given that these are the given that these are the neural nets that we're considering, which ones can draw this picture? So which ones can separate the space with this like weird spiky mountain thing? So let me ask. Uh, let's let's start with the simplest of these and work our way up. Okay. So C seems to be the simplest one. What do you guys think? Can C draw that? No. So C only has one neuron. It can only draw one line. So it looks like this is made up of at least two lines. So C can't do that. Okay. What about A? So this one can draw one line. This one can draw another line. Let's make sure we can combine them now. Okay. And so what sort of combination do we get if we had drawn these two lines? Yeah. So we can shade upwards and say wherever one or the other one shades upwards, like we're good to go. So we could have made this an or, and we'd be set. Okay. Awesome. It turns out you can actually see this structure kind of in here. You kind of just ignore this node. Like this structure right here is that one. And so you can actually just show, you don't even have to do this one. Okay, you can do it that one. Because you could have just weighed like these inputs as zero and like this input as zero. <coughs> just like kind of delete that node to zeros. Okay, so that one, that one's good. And then this one, you can see again, we can get this by kind of ignoring that. Okay, by passing through those. So we're not gonna ignore them like totally, we're just gonna pass through so we can have like values of like ones for the, for the weights or 0.5 for the weights and one for the threshold or something like that. Okay, so we can just pass through those. So this one can also do this. Okay, so that one's not too bad. What about something like that? Only B? So why do you say B? So actually, this each node is only has access to two parameters. So each node can only draw a line. So we can make three lines, though. Yeah, but that's a good point. None of them can make curves. Okay, so this one can't be done by any of them. Okay, one last one, and then we'll move on. What about something? So can C do it? Absolutely not. So how many lines does this need? Three. Okay. So we can rule out A, C, and D immediately. Because their input layers only have two, uh, one or two nodes. Let's look at B. B can draw three lines. So which three lines do you guys want to draw? Do you want to that one, that one, and that one? Yeah. Let's call those. So now for you guys, it's really easy to see, okay, well now we have a line, just pick this in this box and shade it. But the machine needs a way of combining those inputs. And we need to use neurons for that. So now the question is, can we combine inputs to get these two shaded regions with just one node? 
And so we could think about this and we could say, well, we've got line one, we've got line two, and we've got line three. And we could think, what does each one want this space to be, and this space to be, and this space to be? Right? So this is actually kind of complicated because we want one like below N1, but to the left of N2, but only if it's to the right of N3. Otherwise, we want like to the right of N3, and it's not that easy to do. So we can actually work this out. But it turns out that this one node is not sufficient for combining these lines to just shape this. So I could have done something like, if I had asked a question like this, so here are the three lines. And all I did was, let's shade above each line. So, so I combine them with an or. I could have done that. Right? I could combine them with an and, too. And so maybe I could have gotten something like this. So above all the lines, so just this space, huh? And then like, I could have gotten something like that. But getting something like that actually requires more than just one node. And so these, these belief blocks are not all the possible functions you could do with one node. So I don't want you guys to be like, oh, you can't do it with an and or not, so you can't do it. There's other things you can do. But it just turns out that that one is too complicated for just one. Okay. So we can prove that pretty rigorously, but it will take some time to like analyze like what each line can do and how we could have combined it. Okay, awesome. Okay. Now let's talk about. Let's say you have one of these things, and you have this whole complicated mess. Some nodes. And, you, know, you could even have like two output nodes or something. General picture. So remember, we're going to call this layer our input layer. Everything in between is going to be like our logic layer. And then the last two, some people draw like this line here, some people draw it here, some people draw like through the node. But the last two nodes are part of like the output layer. Right? Just anything that talks to the outside world. And so this here is that box I had drawn at the beginning. And each little weight and threshold is one of those knobs we could have turned. Okay, so we have control over those. Awesome. And so now, how are we going to control those knobs to do better? So you can imagine you can construct this thing and draw some lines, but then what you'd like to do is not do any hard work. You'd like to make this neural network and just pass in all of your training points, and it should just learn how to classify things based on training points. You, have, you shouldn't have to do anything, really. You should just be able to pass them in through some algorithm that tweaks the weights for you. So there's one actual little problem, which is that when we have a node, and we have the T, and we have you know the weights W1, W2, and you know there could be more of these, Wn, lots of inputs, and output. This T is not really a weight, um, but maybe we can make it into a weight, so we can just kind of abstract away the fact that there's this threshold thing. We can just think about weights only. And so you could have thought about this weight, Right, this gives you like in the simple case where we only had two things, we got something like, like that. So I can transform that through some extremely simple algebra into that. And now I can make t a weight and minus one a constant input that all the nodes get. And so each node, instead of having a t, is actually going to have a another one as an input, and it's just weighted by t. Okay, So these two equations are the same, right? So this, this abstraction just lets me think of t as a weight, so that I can just talk about weights from now. Okay, that's all it's there for. Okay, cool. So now, the question is, how can we make this do better? So there's a ton of math that come, goes on here, but I'm just going to teach you guys the super easy thing, and so you guys won't have to do all of that. Um, so we want some sort of thing that's going to tell us how well we're doing so far. And so that thing so that's how the function that we use to tell how well we're doing. So out star is like the thing, that's like the one we want. And out is like the thing we're getting right now. So we could pass in, you know, some x, and we could get some out, but we really wanted out star. So how well are we doing? We use this function, we get a number. That's how well we're doing. Okay. 
Um, so this is actually just this is just like a difference of squares thing. It's like if you've ever done like least squared regression, very similar to that. A lot of statistics stuff uses an equation similar to this. It also has a really nice derivative, which is nice because we're going to try to maximize the accuracy. And so by maximizing, we're going to like take the derivative of this thing and set it equal to zero and do stuff. And the nice thing is when you take the derivative of that with respect to the thing that we can change, because right, we want to change the knobs. What do the knobs change? They don't change what we want. They change what comes out. So we have control over this thing. So maybe we can take a, uh, the partial derivative with respect to out of this thing and figure out how we could change out to make the accuracy better. right? And then we get an idea of how to change the out. But you don't really have control of the out. We have control of the w's. So maybe we can relate changing the w's to changing the out and changing the out to changing the accuracy. And that way we get a way of changing the w's to changing the accuracy. Okay. So a really easy way to do that is, what if I had taken the partial of accuracy with respect to one of the weights? <coughs> and so what this, what this is kind of thinking about is, imagine all the other weights are just constants, right? We're taking the partial. And so the accuracy is, could be some complicated function like this. And the w could be like there, right? And so let's say the w is right here right now. What we're going to try to do is take the partial so we can get like the slope of this line. And we're going to kind of see and be like, mm, to make the accuracy better, I want to nudge w a little up. Little up is going to make, make it go over there. That's a higher accuracy. Right? Now, I don't want to take too little of a step. Otherwise, I have to keep doing this a bunch of times to get to that little slope up there. But I don't want to take too big of a step and go like all the way over here either. So we have some way of controlling our step size, which we're going to talk about. Um, but yeah, this, this is we want to minimize this. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to try to think about how can we change w to increase the accuracy. So we have control of the out. So how do we get how do we get the accuracy dw? Well, we can take the accuracy the out and then take the out dw. Right? And just by the chain rule, we can get the accuracy dw. And that's what we want. We want this thing so we can start making adjustments to w. Okay? Now, it, it turns out that to do all this stuff, you have to be able to take derivatives. But remember that our things have like a step function, which aren't differentiable. Right? They have like a, if it's greater than or equal to, do this. If it's not, do that. That's not like something you can differentiate. So instead of doing that, we use this thing called a sigmoid, which looks like that, but it's continuous and it's like differentiable. And we can use that. Okay? And so there's a bunch of equations that come out of this. Let's update weights. So I'm just going to skip to that part. And so what we do is for each node that we have, we come up with this thing called dB, where B is a node. Okay, B is not a weight, B is a node. So for each node, we come up with this number. also have a different form of it. We'll talk about when you use which one and why they're different at all and what the intuition is behind them in a second. Okay. So you can imagine you have some complicated thing all connected all the way up. And then the last node is, is giving you your out. Right? And so it's really easy to ask, like, for this last node that has an output, what can we do to change the output? Oh, we can just like change our weights, and that will directly change the output. Okay? Because this node's connected to the output, so it doesn't have to ask really anyone else. It can just look at the output and change it by changing its weights. So this formula right here, the simpler one, is for the output layer. And that makes sense because this one doesn't depend on any other nodes. You can see we don't have these. This delta, this uh, node delta number, it doesn't have any other deltas in it. It just kind of depends only on the output and what we want as the output. This one is for inner layer. You can see this one kind of depends on other things. And so the idea is what if you had B and its output, um, let me draw it this way. It has one output, but that might be piped to a couple <coughs> different nodes. 
Each one of these is a member of my set C, which is outgoing from B. So what I'm going to do is I think, hmm, how could B change its weights so that I could change the output? Well, I have to consider that it's going to change the guy after me, right? And so that's what this is doing. Right, so this is the guy after me, and I'm going to I'm going to weight those by the weight from B to C. So this could be like a weight from B to C, right? This is like C1. This is like weight from B to C2. This is weight from B to C3. And so I can calculate these first by going from the outside and get this equation for the out output layer and work my way in, applying this rule until I get all the way to the node that I wanted. And I could have asked, like, how do I update this weight all the way back here? So this is connected through some complicated thing all the way up to the output over here. I could have asked, how can I change this weight right here, let's say like the B value for this node, to make my accuracy go up. So what I would have done is calculated all these values for all the nodes. Okay, So I can start by calculating for this node using this equation. Once I have that one, I can move in a layer. And now that I have this one, I can use that value here to calculate this for this inner one. And keep moving in until I get all the way there. OK, great. So now we have all these expressions for these like weird node numbers. How do we use the node numbers to update our weights? And so the final thing you want to do is to change a weight from A to B. What you're going to do is you're going to take R, which this is just a constant, which is actually our step size. And this has to do with, remember when I said like, we're starting at one point and we want to take steps up to the top, but we don't want to take too big of a step or too little of a step. We choose R so that we take like reasonable size steps. That's what that's there for. Then we have times output of A, and then we have times delta of B. Okay. And so that is how we compute how I should adjust that weight. Okay. So there's a bunch of math here. You don't need to understand exactly how we got there, but you need to understand that this part, this out one minus out. It comes from the derivative of the sigmoid function, which remember the sigmoid is just an approximation for the step function. And this part actually comes from our accuracy function. You can tell if we take the derivative of this with respect to out, you're going to get that. Okay. And then this part comes from the fact that uh, the internal node depends on nodes after it. So we keep using this node, uh, this rule over and over, and we're going to have to depend on nodes after us and weight them appropriately, and so we have to use this. Because we don't really have access to the output directly, so we have to access the output through the nodes in front of us. That's what this is like conceptually doing. Okay. All right, so there's a lot of math. Um, but hopefully, if you guys just know how to apply these two, you can work your way back. And so I'm probably going to do for a review session for the next quiz, I'll do a problem where we actually do this rule and we work our way back all the way to a node and we update a weight. All right? Yep. Awesome. I have tests for you guys also.